Uh, I do want to start this morning real briefly with some thanks. Uh, thank you for uh, Randy and, and Lawrence for including me in this and uh, supporting my uh, diva-like scheduling changes and demand. I appreciate that very much. It's been very appreciated. And I want to thank you. Uh, you've been an encouragement to me uh, just to be in the class and uh, your participation and a lot of words. And I appreciate that deeply and won't, won't forget it. So thank you very much. Um, we've been talking about this whole trimester, discipleship in daily life with our three goals that we repeat it every time. And we want, we want to do it again this morning. We want to learn and resolve to be with Jesus. So that we can become like Jesus. And then we can do as Jesus did and does. And that's what we've been talking about this trimester. Um, we're going to do a review today, uh, somewhat of a whirlwind. Of, uh, I want to just touch briefly on each of the topics we've talked about. And then some a wrap up at the end. Uh, something I came across uh, this week during some preparation was about the term disciple and we've talked about it and you've probably heard all of this before and maybe all this put together this way but it's kind of made an impression on me this time uh, the word christian uh, as i understand was used three times in the new testament and if, if i understand correctly it appears that all three times it appears to have been used by non-believers in describing disciples of jesus and uh, the term Christ, uh, anointed one, it's a, a Greek word, means the same as Messiah, if I understand that correctly. And, you know, we use the term Christ, you know, it's completely synonymous with Jesus, but it wouldn't necessarily have been even the word Messiah. We use that word Messiah today in, in other ways, you know, if a, here again, sports, but if a quarterback's going to lead a team that's never had a championship. He's called the Messiah. He's going to be leading us. He's the anointed one to lead us in that way. And that, that term um, Christian, uh, used first at Antioch, uh, was applied uh, it, it was very early on, became very associated with Jesus himself, but it may not necessarily have been always that. These people, they're looking for a Messiah. They're they're Christians, they're looking for an anointed one. They have a, this almost fanatical following of this one now that they believe is the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. Christ Jesus. Jesus the Messiah. But what they were, when they were called that, were disciples. They were people who were following Jesus in, in some people's view in an almost fanatical way. Uh, they looked like him. They sounded like him. They acted like him. Many of them, some were apostles, some weren't. They lived with him. They knew him. And so they were, they were very obviously disciples of Jesus. They were labeled followers of him, Christians, these followers of this deliverer, this anointed one, this Messiah. That's what we're after. We're, we want people to see us and if they get to know us at all they want to we want them to see that we want to be with jesus in every way we can on this earth and we want to be with him when our time here is over if we want to be like jesus we want people to if they have any kind of an accurate picture of jesus we want them to associate us because we look like it and act like it and we do and we treat them as jesus we see them as jesus in all the ways that see them as Jesus does, and in all the ways that that will motivate us to address people and treat people and make them want to become disciples, and that's what we've been talking about this trimester. I hope I hope something that's been said here has rung with you and motivated you. I do want to go uh, just through the topics, just to touch base. I, I know you've been here for most of them, maybe not all of them, but. Um, the first group of topics, uh, we've kind of labeled them as, as uh, cleansing and preparing the vessel for us. And looking for and identifying things that are in our lives, in our spirit, who we are, um, that we need to uh, 
change, possibly remove. And um, in preparation then for filling that vessel back up with those things that would make us look like Jesus and, and be like Jesus and do as Jesus. Um, so the first few topics uh, were about that. We talked about simplicity and material detachment. Um, one of the things we talked about was simplicity cultivates the great art of letting go. Simplicity aims at loosening inordinate attachment to owning and having. Simplicity brings freedom and with it generosity. And we talked about the fact that with regard to material things, no one can serve two masters. And we we're familiar with that passage, but we understand that generally we are beings who are going to have some kind of master. And we can't serve in a discipling way. We can't serve two of them. And we talked about all the things that are in our lives materially that can be impediments to us becoming and being recognized as disciples of Jesus. Um, and we're going to come back and talk about these. I want to get some input from you, especially as we go, at the, go to the end of these topics. We talked about that same process for our spirits, for the spiritual attachments that we have. We talked about spiritual attachments to things we shouldn't have and possibly improper spiritual attachments, even to good things that can be impediments. We talked about idols um, that we can have in our lives that prevent us from being um, spiritually attached in a healthy way to those things that Jesus intended for us, that <coughs> God intends for us. Um, we talked about the difficulty in doing that. Uh, I think all of us would admit and... Um, recognize that, that changing those things, clearing out the vessel, intentionally naming those things that are blocking us, and then going through not just the decision, but the process of detaching from them. And, and we talked about understanding that's not just saying, hey, I, I no longer want that. It's going to take effort, especially um, things that may be uh, addictive. That can be any number of things, but it's going to be a process with ups and downs and, and bumps and bruises. And um, if we are going to be disciples, we're going to have to um, take time out. We're going to have to look for them, name them, recognize them, admit them, and work on cleaning them out before we can fill up our spirits with what should be there. Uh, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's, that's, that's a, a synopsis of what our, where our, our deep spiritual attachment should be. We talked about uh, the role of, of solitude and silence in... Preparing ourselves for moving forward. Um, we talked about solitude being a formative place because it gives God's spirit time and space to do deep work. When no one is there to watch, judge, interpret what we say, the spirit often brings us face to face with hidden motives and compulsions. And we stand squarely before God without props. Um, <clears throat> Does that, does that uh, resonate, the part about uh, nobody else being there? It's a time for us when we're talking about being by ourselves and being silent and listening as Jesus did. Um, applying a brutal honesty in those moments. Uh, do you do that? And I don't know if you're if you're like me. Do you um, sometimes uh, shy away from the results you get pretty quickly when when you see yourself uh, honestly? Does that happen? <coughs> or is that just me? Um, so we talked about the importance of making that uh, a habit, making time in our lives to be by ourselves and to be silent. And listen, and listen for what Jesus intends for us to hear. 
That involves, of course, reading his word and knowing what it says, but it talks about, but it's, it's vitally important for us to be in, we, we use the word intentional over and over and over in this class, but it, it's important for us not to be, um, not to let that go, but to make it intentional. And we're talking about, we're talking about being intentional about all of these topics when that comes up over and over. We're talking about being intentional in a way that makes it become part of our spirit. Uh, makes those things that are beneficial to us become more and more habit and more and more part of who, they, who we are and changing our spirit in that way. And we've also talked about for several of these topics that that happens, but then there's going to be times in, in our journey where that becomes... We get better and worse at that. And so throughout our, 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 the course of our lives, doing this again, whether we go through a whole study like this in a class setting, but reevaluating, are, are we still making our spirit like Jesus wants? And are we still being recognized as disciples of his, like he would want us to? We talked about the, the importance of, of rest and Sabbath, and Sabbath rest, and, and what was intended there. I know Lawrence, uh, this was a very important topic um, for him, even though he never takes a trimester off from teaching. Um, but the importance of that kind of rest in our lives, uh, we understand that, that that command that was given in the Old Testament is not something that's binding, but we can see clearly that Jesus intended for us to have rest and not just the kind of rest that's purely recreational, the kind of rest that is restorative to our spirits. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble and hearty, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That scripture clearly tells us what kind of rest we're to have, the kind of rest we're to um, intentionally put in our lives regularly. Um, I'm, I, again, it's one of the things I'm not so good at. And when I do uh, rest or recreate, I, 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 mine has not always been this kind of rest, the kind of rest that really uh, works towards restoring my spirit and my mentality and preparing me more for serving. Um, so that is one of the topics that, that um, I think during the course of this study has, has made a difference to me. I hope we'll continue to do that. Then we talked, uh, then we transitioned to um, a section of, of lessons intended to help us fill back up. If, if we've gotten good at and made progress towards removing the things from the vessel that keeps it from holding the things it should, um, what is it that we're going to put back in? And I think we would all recognize that um, starts and is uh, continually fed by God's Word. God's, God's Word and instructions, His revelation to us. So we talked about Bible study. We talked about um, how important that is what some impediments are to that. And Randy talked to us also about a couple of different methods. One called the Jesus Apprentice Method, another called the Detective Method. And there are any number of, of ways of going about studying, but making sure that God's will for us revealed in His Word is not just something we understand, but something that becomes part of our heart, part of who we are, part of that changed spirit. Um, so that, especially so that when challenging time comes, when temptation comes, uh, when those things come into our lives, God's word is going to be, his will for us is going to be imprinted there. Um, we talked about a couple of specific ways of going about doing that. Um, devotional reading and that is separated out a little bit from study uh, devotional reading we, we talked about a couple of things to kind of uh, delineate those for us 
Reading not to master the text, which is an important, valuable thing to do during our Bible study, but taking time out to read uh, Scripture for us in a way that um, that word will help master us, master our hearts, master our actions. Prayerfully dwelling on a passage of Scripture. And again, not just for uh, intellectual understanding, but for uh, dwelling in a way that imprints it on our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Listening deeply to God's personal word to you. Um, people use the term uh, a lot of times personal gospel, and it can be misused, but the gospel is personal. Um, the all of his words and instruction, but the gospel, the good news about Jesus and about us being redeemed, it ought to be personal. And if, if that's not something uh, that feels to you or points in your life, which is, a, is more common, I think, for us, at least for me, at points in my life, it hasn't necessarily felt so personal. And part of what I think made that not happen like it should was not giving time to devotional reading. I think there were times like that where I was, there was still Bible study going on. There were still classes like these, even teaching uh, at times where I still wasn't really reading it in a devotional way. Uh, a way that, that nourished me, um, not necessarily intellectually, but nourished my heart. So I think that's what's going on here with Bible devotional reading. Again, that's, that's uh, um, we break these things out sometimes in a way that, that um, can be helpful, uh, but being intentional about making these distinctions, I'm convinced, can be helpful to us in our journey towards becoming and being disciples of Jesus in the way that he intended. Um, same, same thing with meditation and memorization. Um, paying attention to God with your body by slowing down, relaxing, and breathing deeply is one of the things that was mentioned during that, that lesson. Uh, on Jesus and Scripture, seeing beyond first glance and first impressions to the heart of God, and also meditating on people, seeing them as God sees them. Um, I am not good at, at rote memorization. Um, I, I can, though, I think across the human experience, I think we can also say, though, that the thing you're in the most, if, if, if you've got a, a book or a movie that you love, that has been meaningful to you, it, parts of it become memorized can do quotes from some comedy that you love or some movie that you love and you, you come across somebody else who has the same thing and you, you quote a line and they quote a line and it's because those things were meaningful to you. Um, memorization has value. Um, not just to be able to spit it out in a lesson without opening your Bible, um, which is helpful, but uh, memorization is going to be printing things in your mind <coughs> Not just so that you can call, not only so you can call them up in times of solitude, but you're going to be able to, uh, when you're discipling or, or working towards making others disciples, which is not always one of those formal sit down, but, but it's, it's about relationships, it's going to be there. Uh, God's word will be there. And if we've, done med if we've meditated on it, and that can be, um, that can come from especially devotional reading, you're meditating on it, you're, you're applying it to yourself in a deeply spiritual way, in a personal way, and then when the opportunity comes for you to do that with someone else, you have, you have uh, in a way, been prepared for that. Um, so, I really did appreciate the way that was broken out. Bible study, devotional reading, and then meditation and memorization. Um, do you meditate on God's Word? When I am doing anything, and this helped me realize, when I'm doing anything close to what we might call meditation, 
and I've never done any any formal meditation process or learned anything like that. When I've done anything close to that, I found that I wasn't really meditating on the word, the words. I found I was meditating on on spiritual matters, as and maybe very deeply personal matters, and maybe especially in times of trouble. But I wasn't doing much meditation on, on the words and what God intended me to, to get from that. And so uh, I'm, I'm trying to do that a little differently now. I'm not good at it yet. But um, again, through the course of this study, that's one of the things that, that has jumped out at me that I need to get better at. And, and I can, when we talk about it, I can say, why have I not been doing that for 50 some odd years? Um, but so again, valuable to do these things regularly. Um, meditation uh, allows us to choose words and images that shape our minds and heart. And memorizing allows us to access divinely inspired thought and wisdom and to access it quickly and, and, and readily. It works in us, uh, this is one of the things also that kind of resonated, works in us even when we are not conscious of its doing so. Does that... Does that make sense at all? That something you've meditated on and spent time on and that comes up often, even when you're not, not specifically doing that, it works on you. I believe that's true. I believe that's true. Um, the same can be said uh, if, if, if you're not absolutely convinced about that. Think about it in terms of things that you've meditated on and spent time on that you shouldn't have. And... and um, I will tell you, even to this day, things pop, things come into my head in certain situations that I know shouldn't be there, and it's because I was spending time, if not meditating exactly, I was spending a lot of time consuming them. So, if you if you can recognize that in in a negative way, then I think you can you can convince yourself that it's going to be positive if we do it the way God intended on the things God. Intended. So again, that was very, uh, that made an impression on me. Then we talked about prayer. And if you remember, we, uh, there are many methods to help you improve your prayer life. We, we focus on one called the ACTS method, which uh, focuses on prayers, uh, including adoration, which is another one of those things that was very difficult for me to separate out and to do effectively. And a lot of the comments uh, and practices, uh, Julia, one that, that you mentioned stuck with me, the alphabetical one. Coming up, coming up with ways to separate out adoration for God in my conversations with Him. We mentioned, uh, I think several of us talked about that. When I try to do that, it quickly becomes Thanksgiving. But keeping that separate, that's valuable. Uh, expressing to God and to His Son my adoration for Him before I even ask Him for anything. Um, we talked about confession, and that's uh, related to something we were talking about earlier in silence and solitude. A lot of these things overlap and have a uh, connection, but um, if you have times of deep honesty and realization during your times of solitude and silence, it can lead to confession. And then putting that into our prayers, if we're talking to a designer and a father especially about a deliverer and a redeemer, then confession is absolutely um, required. If, if, we're not, if we're not realizing and confessing our sins to our Savior and our Redeemer, we're not getting the full benefit <coughs> of, of our conversation with Him and um, what He intends for us to have based on confession. So putting that in our prayers... And that can overlap with talking about confessing to each other, but especially in our relationship and our conversations with our Father. Uh, we talked about the value of thanksgiving. Um, uh, we talked about uh, several specific things related to gratitude in general, even for people who are not believers, how important gratitude is. But when you're, um, when you're talking to uh, people and uh, you express gratitude to somebody for something that is um, deeply valuable to you. 
have you experienced the, the mutual immediate value of that to both parties involved? Okay. Not, not just the, the again, the um, uh, mental process of it, but the heart process of that. You know, when you, when you realize you're, something you've been given or blessed with has, has been very important to you, and you say it, that's different than just having it in your heart. And when you say it to somebody who, um, who gave that to you, and you experience maybe the look on their face or their reaction to that recognition of that and that you've expressed gratitude to them and appreciated them for that. Um, that's all built into our design, being created in the image of God. And so that leads to possibly the obvious thought that it needs to be included in our conversations with God. Okay, we talk about God knows us. He already knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows our thoughts. He knows we're grateful. But it's a different process to um, enumerate and verbalize and express our gratitude to the one who gave us everything. And I, I can't speak for God, but I, I think Scripture tells us very often what his perspective is on us doing these things and expressing our thanksgiving and to God and his his. What that does for him, at least my perception of that, and what it does for us in doing it is, is undeniably valuable in our spiritual lives and in our efforts to become better <coughs> disciples of Jesus. <coughs> Obviously, supplication, and, and I believe a lot of those same things can be said about supplication. In our um, when you... Uh, intellectually understand a need that you have and you realize that need has a deep uh, spiritual uh, component to it <coughs> and even in, even with each other if you're able to express that need to someone who can supply it or help you with it that same two-way value I think is, is obvious um, you're married and you have some deep concern or deep need and you express it to your spouse and uh, there's been times when, and you know I can think of a couple specific times where she said I did not know that um, and maybe maybe that's happened to you with somebody you love and you express uh, explicitly some need or give them some supplication uh, the value to yourself in opening that up and, and making it intentional and making it um, known to that person. Uh, that's, all, that's all God's design and intention. For, so when we include all of these things in our prayers, um, again, there's many ways to look at it. But this was value to, valuable to me in that way, and it has enhanced my prayer life, and I hope that's the case for you too. Um, and... and when we do something like this again in the future, uh, there will be other ways to do that. But this one, this one made a lot of uh, connections for me that I didn't see before. <clears throat> then we moved on to, uh, we called a community, I would say maybe using the vessel that we've cleaned out of, what should, with, of the things that shouldn't be there and then filled it back up with the things that should be there to make it valuable and then using that to show our uh, discipline, our discipleship to others and to start helping them become disciples. And here very quickly, I want to I ask you at the time of giving away, um, but fellowship, hospitality, and generosity and the scriptures uh, full of admonitions to that. Uh, example, correction, and accountability, the extremely important role that those things uh, apply in our lives. We've already touched on it briefly, talking about um, <coughs> confession in our prayers, but correction and accountability in our lives, God's built into our spiritual lives like this. Um, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, my children. Part of that, part of that is accountability. It doesn't necessarily mean just keep going to church. 
It means you need this family and you need to be accountable. You need accountability and correction. Um, and we talked some about both sides of that, how hard it is to do it, how hard it is to take it, and what our spirits and, and our hearts should be when in both of those cases. How do, how do we go about doing it for someone and how do we go about accepting when, when they're gifting that to us? Um, extremely important part of being the disciples that we're supposed to be. We talked about service to others, how um, the Christian discipline of service is one of the most, and I'm convinced of this, but so I'll say it this way, is one of the most important ways the world discovers the love of God. And we can, we can show them the word, we can tell them about that, extremely important, but if we're not showing them love in that way and serving them and, and them seeing us serve each other, um, our efforts in that regard are going to be extremely hampered, I believe. And when they see it in a deep, heartfelt way that it's intended, um, very often their hearts are going to be opened to what the Word says. I see what's going on here. I want it. I want it in my life. I want it to be that way. So service to others. And how service to others is service to God. He tells us that in several places. He says, truly I tell you, the king will reply, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So knowing that we can do, knowing that we can do service for the king, that ought to be uh, moving and valuable to us. The king doesn't mean anything, but he says, you can do service to me. And uh, that should, that should, um, Spur us on. We talked about sharing our faith. Obviously, uh, one of the main goals of us being disciples is to share the word, share the good news, share the need for the gospel um, so that others will want what we have and becoming, disi and becoming disciples themselves. Um, those three things, prayer, trust, and paying attention, were three keys to that, sharing with others, especially... Um, there were several comments made about if we trust our ability or even our knowledge or our discipleship to make that happen in an effective way, we're going to fail. Those things are important. Who is it and what is it that we trust in discipling others? When it comes down to it, throw out what you have to people. If you think it's nothing or not any good, <clears throat> Don't trust yourself. Trust Jesus. Throw it out there. Help make them make sure they're seeing in you the spirit you want them to have, and then throw out what you have and watch it work. Trust, trust the spirit to do his work, uh, and don't restrict him by 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 trusting yourself and restraining yourself. So, if you want to tell me these these are the lessons you have. Is there any particular one that anybody would like to, to say that really made an impression on you or really is something that you've been thinking about after the class happened that you know you're going to take with you? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Tell me your name again. Hi, Hi everybody. My name is Amy. Amy. Yes. yes. Um, example, uh -huh. correction, and accountability. Um, I find that if I come to him like a child, that means that I'm being open with others. And when I make mistakes, I'm able to, if someone can come to me and, and tell me about it. You know, I'm not all prideful and getting bothered because someone tell me that I did this or that and it was wrong. But I, I've learned to be accountable. How important do you think that, how, let me ask it this way. Has that been important for people to see that in your ministry to others? Yes, that's, that's very important because I've learned that just my life alone, I'm being accountable and I'm doing it as unto the Lord. In other words, I can have people who I'm close to and they're getting caught up in different things, but me keeping it, staying in the boundaries of just serving the Lord, they'll see that I love the Lord. It can change people when they know you're consistent. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. correction, being an example, that's very important. Um, so and flip it around. People experience us not doing that. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. They don't want to hear anymore. So you push them away. Absolutely. What else? 
What else? Yes, sir. So in the service to one another, um, the verse that uh, uh, Lawrence used in Galatians chapter 5, through love, serve one another. Mm -hmm. And I had my phone and on my, I had e sword on my phone, so it has a uh, strong concordance. So I looked on that word. There's two different words for serve. One is we get the word deacon that means a servant, a waiter of tables. The other word for service is from doulos, a slave. And that is in that verse in Galatians 5, serve through love, serve one another, means serve as a slave. And what is a slave? It's someone who doesn't have any individual rights, who is the property of someone else. And so I just thought, well, that's pretty astounding. That servant. Because a lot of times we serve, basically, if I got leftover time or leftover resources, and you know. But the idea is that you know, you're totally dedicated to the welfare of someone else. Not just something I do, but who I am. What am I? Yeah. The yeah. servant. Okay. Nice. Anything else? Oh, one more thing. Yes, also prayer. Prayer. Yes. Um, with me learning, uh, get to get to know him more, my prayer is changing more and more. Because now I'm, um, I mean, learning scriptures, I'm learning to pray the scriptures. Because there's times I do not want to read the Bible. And there's times I wake up, I don't want to pray. <laughs> the flesh just be battling, you know, like, no, we're not going to do this today. And then yet I'm like, uh-uh, let me just take on the mind of Christ. Lord, help me with this. You know what I'm saying? So prayer has been something that I know is very important because if you say you love someone, you're going to talk to them, but you're going to listen too. Sure. You're going to wait and see what they have to say because it's both ways. So I had to break that uh, way of what I was taught, just pray, and then that's it. You're supposed to, the same way you talk to someone else, you wait on what they have to say. So is it more intentional now for it's you? It's intentional. And does that make it have to be not necessarily have to be intentional uh, kind of a, it's a, a, now it's like um, it's like okay this is i love you i'm learning more about you i want to be there sometimes i might say two or three words but i'm in his presence there you go that's I, important I, I i like to think of it um there's formal prayer you know at, at, before bed yeah. and, but that continuous conversation mm -hmm. um i i think when it becomes that it's it's more valuable what else The beginning, uh, one of the first lessons or two, one of the things that Lawrence said was, uh, you know, we want to circle back around. To, I want to be with Jesus. And one of the things he said is, I, I want to awaken myself to the reality of the presence of the Spirit of Christ in my life on a moment-by-moment, -moment, day day-by-day basis. Does that sound valuable? Okay, that's being with Jesus. Um... Becoming like Jesus, we could we could spend a lot more time on that and what that means, not just in our actions, but just, but the, the one of the things that's impacted me the most is viewing other people like Jesus does. That's been one a very difficult thing for me, especially with difficult people. Um, but viewing them, and I start, but if when I can do it, I, I start treating them differently. I start reacting differently, even when I'm. Go home and review the act, the action in my going to be all that was such a. But if I can think of them like Jesus, my spirit is changed by doing that in the way Jesus did. So becoming like Jesus, and to do as Jesus. One of the very first things we talked about was it takes um, not just desire, but I'm convinced it takes a deliberate approach. And what that means for you, it may be different for each of us. And whatever process we use to pray, whether it's the Acts method, whatever process we use, all the things that have been suggested in the course. But I think if we will resolve to make it a deliberate approach, um, intentional, then our, our hearts will change, our spirits will change, they can become more like Jesus, and then we will start to do as Jesus did. Who's got the closing words? Who wants to? Randy? I was just going to say, we, we talked about a, a lot of this at the beginning, Morris said, but make every moment holy. We used a book called that, which I really love, but make that a part of our daily discipleship. Make every moment holy. So yes. far. Yes. Thank, thank you again very much. Yeah.